Now, um, talking about vision, our vision, uh, Hebrews wants to show us what God's word says about Jesus uh, in the Old Testament and in the divine service. And uh, that vision then of Jesus focuses on the divine service, that's the center of it, and on our two-way access. Now, this is a critical term um, in Hebrews. The verb is pros erchemai, erchemai come, pros towards, uh, approaching, coming near to God. And the access is two ways. Uh, uh, God the Father gives his grace and mercy to us through Jesus the high priest. Uh, we uh, receive gr uh, uh, grace, we receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need through Jesus. So it's through Jesus that we receive God the Father and all the gifts from the God the Father. We receive everything good uh, from God the Father. So that's the uh, sacramental side of our relationship, to use classical Lutheran liturgical term. Or if you want to term, speak in terms of uh, patristic uh, theology, this is the catabatic side, the descending side. And this is the anabatic, the ascending side, the sacrificial side of the, uh, of the divine service and of our relationship with God. So we have access to the Father through <coughs> Jesus the Son uh, and through the presence of Jesus the Son. It's not through Jesus you know, 2,000 years ago or up in heaven or at the end of the world. It is access here and now. Uh, we have uh, access to God the Father. Uh, we uh, present our prayers and praises and offerings uh, to God the Father through Jesus. So that's the vision of access. Access to God, uh, access to God through Jesus already now here on earth. Or to put it in imaginative terms, we have full access to heaven already now here on earth. That's the core of the vision. Now, I want to unpack some of that from Hebrews. So instead of just looking, we'll be looking at particular passages later on the course, but I want to give you the big picture of the vision that is being painted by Hebrews. Uh, uh, what is it that we receive, this side, from God through Jesus, our great high priest? Uh, Okay, now, um, we gain the better things that belong to salvation. There's a very significant uh, phrase, better things, better things. Now, uh, notice if there's, uh, uh, there's a comparison that's being uh, uh, introduced here. Better things than when and where. So we have better things now than who had, when, and where? People in the Old Testament, people in the Old Covenant. Now, uh, Hebrews uh, 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 explores and teaches the continuity between Old Testament and New Testament more clearly than any other book in the New Testament. There were good things that God gave to his people in the Old Testament. Uh, good things, but we receive even better things. And here, probably the language of Hebrews is, is influenced by Hebrew itself. You, you remember when you did Hebrew that Hebrew doesn't have a superlative case. Um, you only have sort of comparative case. So, uh, 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 when you wanted to say something is better than something else, you, you say it is good from that. It's good in comparison with that. And to do the superlative, you've got to do it differently, like Song of Songs means the best songs. Uh, holy of Holies, the most holy place. So that's the superlative degree. But strictly speaking, in Hebrew, you, you don't have a superlative degree. You only have a comparative degree. 
So the better things now uh, that we now have uh, from God that the people in the old covenant had not yet received from God. You get you, have you got the basic idea? Let's have a look at the key passage, uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9. Hebrews 6, verse 9. Oh, yes. Who'd like to read it? Can you please read it, Mark? You've got it there? Hebrews 6, verse 9. And can you just make, uh, sort of tag this verse? It's easy to overlook it, uh, but it's quite significant overall in the uh, structure of this sermon. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, you feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Uh, he's warning about falling away from God and losing uh, uh, our salvation. And he says, we speak about these things, but for you, beloved people of God, we are sure, we're convinced uh, that uh, you have better things, that this does not apply to you. Now, he says that these are the better things of salvation. Now, uh, this touches on something and correct something that is very a, a, a uh, misteaching in some Lutheran circles uh, where you have uh, which only focuses on justification and salvation okay there's more to the work of Jesus than your salvation or your justification you know uh, classically speaking you'd say it, it, it the technical term is sanctification but Hebrews doesn't uh, distinguish, doesn't use justification, doesn't talk about sanctification, talks about salvation and the better things that belong to salvation, which we receive as a result of being saved. So you get the basic picture? Since we are saved by Jesus, our Saviour, and since we are saved already here and now, in this life by faith, these are the better things that we gain as a result of that. So if you can, um, if I could use an analogy, okay, uh, you, let's say you're married. The marriage ceremony is the basis of your marriage, but uh, there's more to marriage than the marriage ceremony. Uh, uh, there are the better things of marriage, and you know what the better things of marriage are. It's, it's what comes as a result of being married. So these are the things that come as a result of being saved through faith in Jesus. Now, what are the better things that we have? The first, and we won't have a look at these passages unless you uh, uh, want them explained. Uh, just follow them closely and uh, see if you understand them without having to look at the passages. The first of these is we have a better hope of access to God. We have a better hope of drawing near to God. You know that in the Old Testament, Access to God was restricted, was limited. If you think in terms of the tabernacle, uh, you have the tabernacle itself, you have the entrance there, you have the altar here. Okay. There was limited access to God in the Old Covenant. Uh, the, the closest that people could come to God, the ordinary people, was at the altar. The altar was the meeting, meeting point between God and his people in the daily service at the tabernacle and then later at the temple. So uh, the people had access to the altar, but they could draw near to the altar, but they could never touch the altar, put anything on the altar. Only the priests were allowed to mount the altar to uh, actually uh, uh, not just draw near to the altar, but to uh, 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 be on, touch the altar. So the people had limited access. How close could the ordinary priests come to God and where? Not ordinary priests, no. Uh, how close did the priests come to God every day in the divine service? Not this altar, but this altar here, the altar of incense, before the curtain. So every day, and I'll just give you a map out and I'll, I'll fill this out again, uh, the daily service consisted basically of four enactments. Uh, 
the lamb was slain. Now that's not part of the ritual, but then the blood was splashed against the sides of the altar by the priest on duty. And then the priest on duty, after washing his hands and feet in the basin, which was uh, the tub, which was there, uh, entered the holy place in order to burn incense here before God. Uh, so this is the close he came. And then he would come out from here and then the, he would present the offerings of the meat from the lamb, uh, flour mixed with olive oil and incense, uh, which produced a column of smoke from the altar. There were steps to the altar. He'd mount the altar, put this on there, uh, and then uh, he would stand in front of the altar and bless the people. So he would come into God's presence, interceding for the people, representing them, bearing their names on his breastplate. You remember the 12 tribes of Israel? So he'd bring the people in to God, and what would he bring out from God? God's blessing. Uh, the sweet smell of God's acceptance of his people, the sweet savour or aroma of God's blessing. He'd bring it out. Uh, and then uh, the last stage of the daily ritual was the priest would eat the most holy food of the leftover uh, flour from the daily service. So the daily service, you have four stages, the splashing of the blood against the altar in the rite of atonement, the burning of incense in the holy place, the uh, smoking up of the offerings to God, which culminated in the Aaronic benediction performed here in front of the altar, and then there was the holy meal where the priest would eat the food that came from the Lord's table, the most holy food. Now, how... Uh, Ordinary people and you know, priests who were not officially on duty could only come so close to God. Priests, when they were in their office every day, could come here. Uh, once a year, and once a year only, um, uh, with severe restrictions, the high priest was allowed to come as close to God as possible in the Old Testament, which was the Holy of Holies, the throne of God was here. Uh, a dark place, the priest, high priest couldn't see anything. There's a double layer curtain here. Uh, uh, before, as he came in the first time, he'd burn thick uh, incense that uh, produced dark, dark cloud. So he entered the Holy of Holies in a cloud of incense. Uh, so. He'd see nothing and he'd splash the blood, uh, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and then on the floor of the Holy of Holies. Now, uh, the first one. So we have the hope of what? Better access to God than the people of Israel ever had. In fact, we stand where no high priest ever stood in the Old Testament. Where do we go because we have Jesus the high priest. Which place? Holy of Holies where? In heaven. So uh, uh, we go where Jesus went, the heavenly sanctuary, and that's the place where we go. We have access to that heavenly sanctuary, that heavenly holy place. Secondly, oh, just can I pause there? Have you got the basic picture? Now, notice that that's the first better thing that's touched because all the other better things, in a sense, are flow out from here. Um, we have a better covenant than which? The covenant that God made with his people at Sinai. That covenant, which uh, uh, the basic content of that was the uh, uh, divine service that was enacted by the priests at the tabernacle. So we have a better covenant uh, than the people of Israel ever had, and the covenant that's enacted on better promises than the promises that God made about the divine service in the Old Testament. Thirdly, we 
and this comes as a result of that, we are purified from impurity, we are cleansed from impurity by better sacrifices than the sacrifice of the flesh and the blood of the lamb and the other animals that were offered to God in the Old Testament. Uh, the better sac the purification that we have from the better sacrifices are the sacrifices of Christ's body and particularly his blood. So through the blood of Jesus, we are cleansed from all impurity so that we are able to approach God's holy presence in heaven itself. Uh, number four, coming out of that, then we have the promise and the possession already of uh, better eternal possessions. So, for example, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit and all the gifts of the Spirit uh, which are given to us. Uh, better possessions than Israel ever had, uh, the possessions of the land of Israel and all the blessings that they received from the land. And that leads to the next uh, better thing. We have the possession of a better heavenly fatherland, homeland, than Israel ever had. There were a number of extraordinary cases in the Old Testament where people who had died were resuscitated from the dead. Remember those cases? Elijah and Elisha were the particular uh, instances. So people who had died were brought back to life. They were resurrected. But they were brought back to this life and they were not resurrected to a life beyond death, they still had to uh, die. They became sick and eventually died. But we have the hope of what kind of a resurrection? A better resurrection from the dead, and a resurrection to eternal life with God. God has provided something better for, for us by our perfection together with the people of God in the Old Testament. Now, you have the two coming together. Um, uh, there, uh, there was, God had something better in store for his people than he ever gave to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. And the picture is that Hebrew has, they wait for Jesus to come and they wait for us so that together with us, we can be perfected for service together with Jesus in heaven itself. So uh, uh, we have uh, the provision of the better things uh, going beyond the people of God in the old covenant, the better things that they are looking for, now they enjoy together with us. Okay, now, um, there's usually with Hebrews, there's, there's kind of implied lists. Lots of lists. Can you see there's lists here of better things? Uh, 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 when you get a, a list of these kind of things in Hebrews, you always look at the first one and the last one. The first one's foundational. The last one is maybe not so much the goal, but the most fundamental better thing. Now, I would expect, oh, say being a Lutheran, what would you expect is, is the best of all the better things that we have uh, than the people of God in the Old Testament. Forgiveness of sins. Uh, you're a good Lutheran, aren't you? Oh, yes. And that's good. But, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's, you see in the next one, it's implied, but it's, it's bigger than that. So the better things end with a list of, uh, where, where we have a depiction of the theophany. Remember the term theophany? The uh, theophany of the triune God in the divine service. Where do we come? Where do we come when we gather together for the divine service? Hebrew says we come into heaven itself, heavenly Jerusalem, and there are seven invisible things. We come to heaven even though we remain here on earth. We come to uh, um, thousands and thousands of angels in festal assembly. We gather together with the church around the world, the ecclesia, 
a church universal. We gather in the presence of God, the judge of all. We gather together with the spirits of righteous made perfect, all the saints who've gone before us, and we gather together in the presence of Jesus, who is the mediator of a new covenant. He not only mediates the new covenant, but he is the mediator in the new covenant. And then comes the climax of those seven invisible realities that you experienced yesterday when you celebrated the divine service. The last one, and you have come to the blood of sprinkling that speaks what? A better word than the blood of Abel. Now the blood of sprinkling, we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, blood was sprinkled on the vestments and the body of priests when they were ordained into the priesthood. Um, we are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, the blood that cleanses us entirely, the blood that makes us as holy as Jesus is holy. And uh, that blood is not sprinkled on our bodies, but it's sprinkled in our hearts and on our conscience. So we are totally clean and holy through and through. Now, where do we hear the better word that the blood of Jesus speaks to us. Picture the speaking blood that speaks something better. Abel's blood called, called for vengeance. Right, oh, just say, come on, loudly. Given and shed. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This is this cup is the blood of what? The new covenant, or this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. The speaking blood that speaks something better than the blood of Abel did. Um, the speaking blood, which is sprinkled, uh, not on our, just on bodies, but sprinkled on our hearts. We drink it so it comes in us and makes us totally clean, totally holy. Uh, can you see how wonderful it is? Okay, think in terms of this. What are the great gifts? You know, God gives us his grace, his mercy. That's general terms. And it's very hard to, 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 to imagine that, to picture that. Okay, that's spelt out in greater detail, everything good. These are the better things that belong to our salvation. Because we are saved, because we are justified, we have access to these better things. And we receive these better things every time we go to church. Pause. Any questions or remarks? Yes, please. Uh, you know, kind of the better resurrection. What is, what is the better resurrection? Why is the resurrection? Because uh, uh, so, I have an idea. Okay, uh, let's 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 just go to the New Testament because that's quite easy. L Lazarus was raised from the dead, okay, by Jesus, and there were other uh, people that were raised from the dead. There was uh, 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 the uh, uh, the uh, head of the synagogue, his daughter, was raised from the dead. Now um, uh, she was raised from physical death and restored back to physical life here on earth. I don't, uh, but it, 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 it was, a, if you like, a temporary reprieve. Uh, she still, say, Lazarus still got, grew old and sick and eventually died. So uh, uh, his resurrection uh, was, a, 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 if you like, a reprieve from death rather than a conquest of death and didn't uh, involve a total transformation. Now, through Jesus and our baptism, we have what kind of life? Eternal life. What does that mean? We don't die again. We don't die again. That's the negative. What's the positive side of that? We live in the presence of God, and it's even better than that. Yeah, okay, we don't die again. That's still negative. We not only live in the presence of God, but... We actually share in the life of God. We have supernatural life, if you like. 
We share in the life of God the Father. We share in the life of Jesus the Son. We share in the life of the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. We share God's divine life. Yes? Would you say this is, then that existence in heaven is the culmination of Christ's prayer, high priestly prayer in John 17, that may they be one as we are one. That's the perfection of that oneness in yes. heaven. That we are one with God and one with Christ. Yes, and it gets even better than that in that great high priestly prayer because Jesus prays uh, that, uh, that they, his disciples, may be with him where? He is. Where is he? He is with the Father. He's at the right hand of the Father. That place is your place, my place. Uh, uh, it is within the Trinity, if you like, the way I imagine it. Uh, okay, so you don't just have a relationship with Jesus or with God the Father, but you stand in the shoes of Jesus. So you have the Father. You have the Son, uh, and then we'll just leave the Holy Spirit out of it because that gets a bit complicated. Uh, uh, that's, uh, no, that's not in focus in, in John chapter 17. Uh, we are not, here am I, we have the church, I don't just have a relationship with Jesus who has a relationship with the Father. Better than that. I am where Jesus is. Uh, my position is exactly the same as Jesus is within the Trinity, within that fellowship, uh, within the eternal life of God. Uh, the life that the Son has with the Father, the Father has with the Son. So the same love that the Father has for his Son Jesus, he has for me. The same life that Jesus has and he have together is shared and is opened up with me. Now, uh, uh, the best way that I know of imagining this, and it's, it's, I, can't, I can't get my head around it, I can't rationalize this, but I can imagine it, and I can envisage it. And one of the ways that's helped me to imagine it is what happened when I married my wife. Yeah, I didn't just get in, uh, enter a relationship with her, but I entered her family. And I began something new, which was, you know, I was living in my family with my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, okay? Now, um, uh, when I married, uh, her father became my father. Her mother became my mother. Her sisters became my sisters. So I began to live uh, not just within the life of my own family, but I lived within uh, her, the life of her family. So eternal life, that's just amazing, stupendous. Uh, uh, he Hebrews doesn't explore that a great detail because uh, there's two places where he basically touches on this, but John uh, explores this at great detail in his gospel if you're interested in pursuing it further but I better move on. Unless there's something, do you basically get the issue here? Yes? To clarify, you probably said that and I missed it. What makes the promises better now? Is it because they are fulfilled in him? Absolutely. And they are fulfilled, so what? There's a difference between hope and the fulfillment of the hope. Uh, so, uh, uh, Old Testament, you look forward to the time when the hope will be Fulfilled, the promises will be kept. Now, we have what the people on the Old Testament hoped for. So our hope is different to their hope. It's the same content, but what they hope for, we now have. And we have by faith, uh, it's unseen, it's invisible, and that's why it's so hard to imagine. Okay? And you need to imagine it because you deal with what is unseen. Um, we'll just take it in, in the most obvious level. When I went to Holy Communion yesterday, I saw bread and wine, and I saw a pastor dressed in a nighty giving me bread and wine. 
it, that's what I could see with this, these eyes, and with this mind. Uh, but through the word, because of the word, I saw something else, at a different picture. That wasn't my picture. Uh, I didn't see the pastor, but I saw Jesus. And I didn't see bread and wine. I saw body and blood of Jesus. Okay? Uh, uh, that these things, which all the people in the Old Testament were, hope, were hoping for, looking forward to, is now given to us fully. And um, uh, that hope then, which is now, that, that faith, that hope, which is in what is unseen, will eventually be seen at the end of the age. Then what's hidden will then be revealed. But notice the visual language, the visionary language. What's hidden now will be fully revealed there. But the important thing is that we already have all of it here and now. And that's what Hebrews preaches, uh, that we have all this here and now at this time in this place where we celebrate the, uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, wherever that Lord's Supper was celebrated, uh, by the people who heard this sermon. Okay, now uh, is that... Now, I've taken time because lots of other things will fall into place if you see this. Okay, now, he has a look at this from uh, uh, three other angles, three other lists, if you like. There's the list of the better things. And then you have, uh, you know, what's very significant is the verb echo and its various derivatives. Uh, in the uh, letter. Echo means to have, uh, but have as, he uses it in a unique sense, to have as a gift. Not to possess, but to have as a gift. Uh, and he says there are eight invisible things that eschatological things, liturgical benefits that we have uh, by virtue of our faith in Jesus. And it's not just some people, but the whole congregation has eight uh, gifts, eight benefits that are given to it liturgically, that means in the divine service, and they are eschatological. They are the things which we will have fully in heaven, but we already have them here on earth now. Uh, what are those eight invisible possessions is the wrong thing, benefits that are at our disposal. The picture have here is that we have the empty hands and it, it's given to us in our hands. How do we have it there as a gift to us? By the way, kat echo is very important, which means holding fast and other uh, derivatives from this verb. Uh, that's a sideline. So the first and most fundamental gift benefit that we have as Christians, and that's available to us every time we assemble for the divine service, is that we have Jesus as our earthly and heavenly high priest. Notice there are four references to, to this. It's so important, it, it comes back four times. We have Jesus as our high priest. That's, if you like, the central theme of the, uh, this sermon. Because we have Jesus as our high priest, we have strong encouragement or strong comfort from Jesus. Encouragement in faith, uh, uh, we, encouragement in hope, and encouragement in love. More of that later. And notice the word encouragement could be comfort. Uh, this is a very important term uh, in Hebrews. Then thirdly, we have a hope that enters the heavenly sanctuary as a life-saving anchor for our souls. Now, this is a complicated picture. Just imagining uh, in the ancient world, you usually didn't have docks for ships to uh, moor in, in harbours. Uh, you'd come to a shore where there was a, a sandy or gravelly beach and you would uh, beach the ship and you would anchor the ship with your anchor. 
uh, you'd throw the anchor out so with the rising tide it wouldn't be carried away. So the anchor thrown out to land, that's the goal, the goal holds the ship in its place. So we have an anchor for our souls. What's the anchor for our souls? Is Jesus who's gone before us into the heavenly sanctuary and who now anchors us in that place. Um, uh, so what we hope for, what the people of the Old Testament hoped for, which was to come to God, to approach God in heaven and the whole architecture of the tabernacle and the temple points to that. This is what they're looking for, to come close to God, to have access to God. Well, that hope is now fulfilled. So we have hope, fulfilled hope, uh, as an anchor for our soul. Now, what's the picture of the anchor? What does the anchor do? Yeah? It holds you so that you don't, you don't drift away, you don't get lost. It holds you, uh, and it's not an, uh, the picture is not, we see it in individual terms, it's an anchor for me. Um, uh, you have that song, um, oh God, my anchor holds within the veil. Uh, uh, what's that hymn? Uh, Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Notice it's I there, uh, but the anchor is the church's anchor. So you have, if you say, there's an anchor for your congregation, uh, gathering for worship, uh, who anchors your congregation in a safe place so it won't be swept away by the tides and currents of human history? It's the hope uh, uh, that is already realized and given to us in Jesus. So that's what we have. It's a bit of a complicated picture there. Uh, and the best way is not to rationalize it, but to picture it. So get the picture and you get the basic point that's being made. Have you got the picture? So it's, I used to think it was a, uh, you know, a ship would be out in the ocean and you drop the anchor and it would be then out in the ocean. But it's not that kind of anchoring. It's the anchoring when you come to your destination and that, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, that holds you safe in your destination. And the picture is that you're at the very point of disembarking. So we've come into that place, but what, what still remains? We have still to disembark. You know, so the church is in the ship. Uh, now, the architecture of your churches depicts that. What do we call the place where the people sit? Nave. The nave, what does nave mean? Ship. But then you have the front of the church, the, can the chancel of the church, what does that symbolize? You have nave. No, it's not part of the ship. It's the port. And what does the, that place and this fenced off, and you either approach it in Holy Communion or you go into it when you receive Holy Communion? That represents heaven. It represents heaven. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, the ship is still on earth. So in the, the, the classical symbolism of Christian church, and particularly Lutheran churches, uh, uh, and this is very strong in our heritage, okay, the, 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 the auditorium is the ship that we're in, but that ship is anchored in the, <coughs> the sanctuary. Now, uh, there's a funny usage that I still haven't got used to here, which is to, call, uh, to talk about the whole church building as the sanctuary. Now, that's not incorrect, but I, my own um, uh, heritage is to see the sanctuary as the chancel. So the sanctuary is the chancel, and the ship is anchored on, and, uh, and, uh, on the sanctuary so that people can disembark from their chairs and come forward and enter heaven when? Hmm? Every time you come to Holy Communion. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, and it's even better when instead of coming to the edge of the 
chancel, uh, you actually go into the sanctuary. If you have the kind of church that has this configuration, uh, please use it. Okay, you get the classical box church, center aisle, uh, altar here, and uh, you have railings, pulpit, lectern, altar. Now, uh, old Lutheran churches had uh, the altar itself was on a podium, which is above. So you have two levels. You have this level, uh, and in the old Lutheran churches, and you can see it everywhere in Europe, uh, and you go, uh, people would re wouldn't receive communion here, but they'd come and receive communion here. Wonderful symbolism. Uh, that's the, uh, that uh, architecture, in a sense, uh, um, uh, puts in visual terms, uh, gives visual uh, depiction of what uh, we have then by virtue of our hope entering the, um, uh, being anchored in a safe place. And it is, we have strong encouragement, strong comfort. Why? Because uh, uh, it's so strong that nothing can ever rip us away from that anchorage. Yes? Maybe my funeral practice needs to be changed because we bring the casket up to the chancel and then we turn around and take them out. It's burial by sea, I guess. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> and and so you see, there's interesting things how customs have changed, and very often it's for practical reasons. Uh, always, old Lutheran custom, no, always, but typically, because there's many different Lutheran heritages, um, but the... I won't say always, but the one that I'm used to is this. Okay, there's one custom which makes good sense, is if you have the font here, uh, then you place the uh, casket uh, in some way in connection with the font. And the best place is here. So, uh, now, uh, why the font? What? That's where heaven and flesh met. That's where heaven and flesh met. This is, uh, we uh, are buried with Christ and we are raised with Christ in, in baptism. Um, so our death is, uh, our physical death is the uh, dying and in order to rise with Christ. So that's, that's significant. Um, but uh, the custom that I'm used to is, okay, usually have, let me just clarify. Just forget about the pulpit and so on. You have the podium here. Uh, you have railings. Now, and this here, uh, if you have the font here, always in the church that I grew up, the casket would be brought into where? Into the sanctuary. Can you see why? Because by virtue of baptism, where is this supposedly dead person anchored in heaven. And uh, they, they are at the end of their journey. They have disembarked from where? The ship. They have disembarked from the ship. The, the location was also emphasis on the assurance of the resurrection. Oh, yes. The soul had gone, the flesh will follow. The flesh will follow. And uh, it's even better than that because uh, there's a fuller symbolism uh, which Hebrews talks about in chapters 12, uh, being, having, this is one of the things that have, I'll come to it shortly, having such a great cloud of witnesses around us, uh, having these witnesses, who are the witnesses that are all around us in the cloud when we gather for worship? All the saints who've gone before us. My father, my mother, my grandfather, Luther, uh, Abraham. Now, um, uh, in classical church architecture, uh, you sometimes get a freestanding altar and people receive communion all around the altar. But in classical Lutheran churches, uh, uh, the, uh, you only receive communion on, on half of the sides, say two sides. Okay, it's... It doesn't complete the circle around the altar. Who completes the circle around the altar? Hmm? 
the rest of the saints. The rest of the saints, as it were, complete the circle of those who assemble around the altar. So we assemble with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And there's another, and I don't know whether any of you have an old church, um, which used to be was quite common. You'd have the cemetery, do you know where? Here. Cemetery's here, which is a bit funny. Uh, why there? Because the people who've died are still part of the church, the congregation, community. Um, the church consists both of the living and the so-called dead. Uh, the dead who are not dead in Christ. Okay. Picture. Picture. Um, uh, then chapter 10, verse 11 uh, we have, says the author to the Hebrews, 10 uh, verse 19. Did I have 11 there? Yeah, no, 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, having confidence for entry uh, into the holy places by the blood of Jesus. We have confidence. Now, that's a bit of a, a bland translation for something that's much more vivid. It's not in inaccurate. The term is parasia. Parasia is freedom of speech, free speech, bold speech. So we have free speech, the freedom of speech, which allows us to enter the holy places, uh, the heavenly holy places, through the blood of Jesus. We have parasia, uh, confident speech, bold speech, freedom of speech to approach God the Father in heaven. I'll come back to that term, uh, but is that uh, clear enough for the time being? Um, so we have free speaking access to the heavenly sanctuary. We have the lasting possession of a rich reward, uh, which was far greater than the rewards that uh, Egypt offered to Moses. We have a... Uh, lasting possession of a rich reward in heaven. Now we come to the term that I spoke about. We have all around us a cloud of unseen witnesses. A bit odd. We're surrounded by a cloud. Why a cloud? Always when you're going generally in the Bible, uh, uh, don't just get the idea, the abstract idea, but get the picture. Why this picture? Why are these unseen witnesses who witness us as we run the race of faith, why are they in, imagined or envisaged as a cloud? The cloud of God, where is that? What? The cloud of God which hid what? The glory of God which is the presence of God. They have entered the cloud where we still have to enter. Moses entered the cloud on top of Mount Sinai. Uh, the high priest every uh, day of atonement entered the cloud in the Holy of Holies. Uh, uh, when Jesus was transfigured, what descended on him? The cloud. And who was there in the cloud with Jesus? Moses and Elijah, those who'd gone before them. And the disciples were taken up just for a little while into the cloud, which is the cloud of the Father's presence, the glory of God, only for a little moment. And then the cloud lifted and they saw nothing except Jesus only. And then uh, when Jesus ascended, he ascended. You know, I've always had the picture that sort of he looped up into the sky, but that's not what we're told in uh, Acts 1. Jesus ascended into what? A cloud. Which cloud? The cloud enveloped him. The cloud of God's presence, the glory cloud. He was taken up into the Father's presence. And then on the last day, Jesus said, just as you've seen the Son of Man me taken up in the cloud, so I will, how will I appear to you? In the clouds uh, of glory to take you to heaven with me. Those who, they will come and welcome you. They're part of the, 
then the angels and those who have gone before you will be part of the welcoming party within the cloud. So we are surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. That, uh, that's the beginning of chapter 12. Then towards the end of chapter 12, one of the seven invisible rab uh, uh, realities, you have come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Can you see how uh, uh, Hebrews paints a... Uh, very complex, but uh, uh, a very vivid picture uh, of uh, what is given to us in and through Jesus, the high priest, every time we assemble for worship. Um, but uh, now comes the uh, two best things. What do we have? We have God's grace. We have the grace of God the Father, and through the grace of God the Father, we can uh, uh, present God-pleasing service uh, uh, to God the Father. So let us have grace. Uh, now, having received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we offer a sacrifice, or by which we offer acceptable worship, not very good, acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. We have grace. Whose grace do we have? The grace of God the Father which is given to us through Christ. We have grace, and that determines, shapes our worship. So uh, worship in the new covenant, the divine service in the new covenant, is not worship of the law, but it's worship according to the grace of God. We receive grace and mercy from God in the divine service. And then last of all, which ties everything together, we have an altar that's different to the altar at the temple, in the ta at the tabernacle, and then at the temple in Jerusalem. What is the altar uh, and what kind of food do we receive from that altar? Holy food, the body and blood of Jesus, which altar? Is it the altar in Jerusalem? Is it, yeah, is it just the altar in the church? So the heavenly altar, which is also the earthly altar. The two come together. So the altar there in that chapel uh, is at the same time the heavenly altar. Uh, and from that altar, uh, Jesus gives us heavenly food uh, and heavenly drink. And we receive uh, uh, life-giving food. We receive sanctifying, cleansing blood from Jesus uh, and the altar uh, where he presides. The altar, if you like, imaginatively before God. Now, what's important to realize is that in the Old Testament, the altar was not the place in which animals were killed. Can I say that again? It was not a sacrifice in the sense of killing the animal. The altar was the place where blood was sprinkled in the rite of atonement. And it was the place where the holy food, meat and, uh, wine, uh, and bread and wine were, pour, were placed. And that meat and wine was made holy. Some of it was burnt up, but the rest was given to the priests and then also the people to eat. So uh, the priests didn't have to supply their own food when they came to serve God at the uh, tabernacle and then later the temple. God provided them. He's the host. He gives them holy food, or and there's two kinds. There's most holy food and then holy food for them to eat, and he'd give them most holy wine for them to drink, um, with certain restrictions. Okay, so we have access, no, we have those eight um, eschatological benefits. They are liturgical benefits because we receive them, we have them all already here and now in the divine service. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven uh, when we die, to receive those things. Now, any questions on those? You're getting a picture? Uh, 
you, you're seeing, you, you're beginning to see uh, what's going on here, uh, that uh, Hebrews painting. Uh, then two other things, um, as if this is not enough, uh, uh, he has uh, that we have a vision, you know, these, of these uh, better things. We have a vision of our gifts, the benefits that we receive in the divine service. But then we have a vision of heavenly things and eternal things. And it's kind of overlapping. What do we have? A vision of what heavenly things? We have our heavenly calling. Um, now, um, uh, there's a contrast here. Um, we have an earthly calling. What's my earthly calling? Is to be a father, to be a pastor here on earth, etc. This is uh, uh, to be a father, to be a husband. That's my earthly calling. But what is, who has a heavenly calling? A heavenly calling that he uh, um, uh, fulfills in heaven is Jesus. And he shares that calling with who? Us. We have the same calling as Jesus. So we, we have two sets of, of vocations. There's an earthly vocation, earthly calling, but we also have a heavenly vocation. And this is not just for us as pastors, but all the people of God share the same vocation as Jesus they serve together with Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary um, every time uh, they assemble for the divine service, every time they pray. And that heavenly vocation is basically the vocation of intercession, prayer for ourselves, but more importantly, prayer for others. We have a heavenly vocation. It comes from heaven, um, it's, uh, uh, it's exercised in heaven, but the wonder of it, the miracle of it, which is hard for me to get my mind around, is that it's done while we are here on earth. So we have a heavenly vocation for our life here on earth. Yes? If we bring our families into that, as we of course. all around the dinner table. Absolutely. In the morning, at the bedtime, whatever, with our children. And that's, them. that's all that. Their heavenly calling is an eight-year-old child. That's right. Eight-year-old is the same thing. Yes, we have a heavenly calling. Look at Luther's uh, our last part of Luther's catechism, table of duties, misnamed. It's not table of duties. Um, this is a table of service. Uh, according to this, about holy orders and according to our station and vocation. Now, uh, it consists a list of our, our earthly calling in three holy orders. What are the three holy orders? That we serve our, do perform our earthly vocation, um, church, church, church and government. what church, family, and, and the state, the government, yeah, the state, society. So you have those three holy orders. Then how does that the table of duties end? It's the most significant part of it all. You don't know, don't you? Teach Luther small catechism. How, <laughs> how does it end? There's a little quotation from 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. I urge you then, plural congregation, first of all, that prayers be made for all people. I don't? And then, the, then, he said, then he has about loving the neighbor. How do, what's our common heavenly vocation on earth, intercession for all people, and that's this. We have access to heaven here on earth so that we can bring the needs of all people, uh, people in government, all people on earth, we can bring it into the Father's presence. Uh, heavenly vocation. And then uh, the other side, the, the, the uh, uh, sacrificial... Uh, uh, no, the other side of it, the descending side, is that we bring the love of God which we receive from God. Where do we bring that? To the people in our earthly station and vocation. So we have an overlap here between heavenly calling and earthly calling. So the stuff that happens here on earth, uh, we bring the people from here to God 
and we bring God's love from here to the people in the world. Heavenly calling. And we are holy brothers together with Jesus because we have that heavenly calling. Isn't that cool? Isn't that great? Uh, uh, and that happens supremely in the divine service, but of course it happens every, in your family prayers, your family devotions. Uh, that's part of that. Yes? The intercession, you said, is the primary vocation. And just going back to what you said earlier, is that based on the fact that we are seated at the right hand of the Father? That's right. Where Christ is, we are. We have um, a, a privileged place. We have access. You know, just you know, if you want to get around it, just imagine um, that you uh, occupied the same position that um, was occupied by Obama's chief of staff. Now, uh, the chief of staff is, has a privileged position that even the other members of uh, uh, what you call it, the administration, doesn't have. Cabinet, you have the term cabinet? That's our term too, cabinet. So you have uh, Obama governs the country through his cabinet. But even uh, members of cabinet have limited access to Obama and they can only uh, uh, influence then uh, you know, what's the decisions that are made in cabinet, uh, uh, but they have, uh, none of them has open access to him. There's one person, however, who has open access. There might be others. Besides Hillary, uh, not Hillary, um, uh, Michelle. <laughs> There's a slip between cup and lip. Uh, it's his chief of staff. His chief of staff, uh, who has the highest degree of access. Now, if you had that kind of position, and if Obama was a good guy, and did nothing but good, and was prepared to listen to you, just imagine the good that you could do for the USNA. You're in a position where you can uh, represent people and bring their needs, and make sure that the resources of the country were used and targeted in the right places. Now, okay, that's uh, uh, trying to translate what we have uh, from, heavenly in, from heavenly to earthly terms. So all of us have open access to the Father's, uh, the throne of grace, to use the term of Hebrews. Uh, we sit with Jesus on the throne at the Father's right-hand side. And so therefore we can re represent everybody and anybody according to their needs. We have access to God's grace, not just for ourselves, but also for other people. So... Uh, through faith, through Jesus, we have access to God's grace and mercy. Now, our vocation then is to bring that grace and mercy to people in need. And the most important part of that, way we exercise that, is through intercessory prayer. And then we bring, in love, we bring the blessings of God. We administer it according to our earthly station and vocation. Um, I've given you kind of a whole Lutheran theology of vocation. But very often we miss that heavenly dimension of it, don't we? We concentrate just on the uh, vocation within our normal uh, orders. Now it's lunchtime. Uh, let me just very quickly finish this because I think the rest would be... We have uh, heavenly food. What's the heavenly food we have? Holy Communion. We have uh, heavenly places... We have access, we have uh, 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 open right of entry to the heavenly places. Which heavenly places? Uh, heaven itself. We have uh, a heavenly homeland. So uh, my home country, spiritually speaking, is not Australia. Your homeland, your fatherland, is not the USA, spiritually speaking. Even though you're Americans and I'm Australian, we have the same fatherland. We have the same heavenly homeland. And that heavenly homeland is in the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Let's enjoy some lunch. <laughs>